Good morning and welcome to the Computer Channel. Today's dossier programme is the fourth and final programme in this year's network series and it looks at the complex and much misunderstood process of network management. Alistair Sibol, the networking specialist and consultant with the SEMA Group, kicks off the programme with a detailed overview and he looks at the approaches you should be taking to provide end users with effective network services. Michael Emanuel is the Application Engineering Manager at BTN, Baton Thompson Networks. It's Mike's job this morning to assess how useful network management systems really are, when and how to use them. My final guest is Ian Bausch. Ian's a senior manager in the Network Services Division of Hoskins and will today focus on the most common people problems you'll come across and how you can develop a strategy to solve them. Remember, this is a programme where you can phone in and talk to our experts with me here in the studio. The number to ring is 081 681 5280. I'll repeat that for you. 081 681 5280. Well, the phone lines are now open and we'll try and answer your calls in the three or four minutes we have between presentations. But first, Alistair Sibold. Alistair is a networking specialist and a consultant with the SEMA Group. Today I've asked him to open the proceedings with a personal overview. Alistair. As you'll hear later in the program, there are essentially two aspects to network management, managing people and managing technology. I'll discuss the interaction of these two aspects, setting the scene for the more detailed presentations which will follow. In considering the installation or expansion of a network, one is faced with a number of problems, chief amongst which are the following. Conflict between management goals and users' goals. Introduction of a completely new computing culture to those areas of the enterprise which are being networked for the first time. Managing users' expectations. Introducing changes with the least disruption possible. Recognizing and planning for the fact that in the foreseeable future, a state of change will be the norm, especially with the rapid technology developments in the PC land market. Introducing the most appropriate technology with the, within the given budgetary constraints. Ensuring that data security is not unduly degraded by the changes. You'll notice that I didn't mention many specific technology problems. This is because in my experience, it's the people and organizational problems which are the most difficult to fix. There's almost always a workaround for the technology problems. In addition, identifying the likely organizational problems should provide the guidance for the most appropriate means of managing technological change, not vice versa. In a nutshell, the best network in the world is severely crippled if its introduction and management has not met the needs of and antagonize the user community. Having said this, however, it will become apparent that solving these problems requires a great deal of thought and planning for the technological aspects of the network. I'll now turn to a more detailed discussion of the problems outlined above and attempt to provide some pointers as to how they may be solved. In introducing or expanding a network, the goals of management and the user population are often in direct opposition. This is particularly the case when attempting to integrate hitherto standalone PCs into an enterprise-wide LAN. The managerial goal is probably expressed in terms of increased control and efficiency. What needs to be recognized is that this increased managerial control almost invariably reduces the user's control of her PC. This situation, unless managed sensitively, can engender an atmosphere of sullen leadism, which will be very difficult to overcome. In order to avoid this, users must be involved in the planning and decision-making about the network from the very beginning, and such consultation must truly result in their positive input being integrated into the network planning. The penchant of British management culture for management by command is entirely inappropriate here. Related to the point I have just mentioned is the fact that an entirely new computing culture is being introduced into the parts of the enterprise that are having networking introduced for the first time. This is easily overlooked especially in the case of networking standalone PCs as there is a tendency on the part of those not directly involved to regard a PC network as merely a bunch of standalone PCs with an extra wire coming out the back. This couldn't be further from the truth as the extra wire is the very thing that will introduce the user population to their first experience of managerial and MIS control over their computing practices. Again, user involvement in the whole process is key to un addressing this problem as this will allow them to understand why these new rules are being introduced, as well as allowing management to reconsider some of their proposals in the light of user input, 
before they are irreversibly committed to the introduction of unpopular working practices. In the previous discussion, I've implicitly presented a scenario of the user population opposing aspects of the introduction of networking. Of course, unless you are very unlucky, this will not be the only or even the prevalent attitude. On the whole, attitudes will vary between it will never work, I'm not interested, from people with bitter previous experience of networking, to enthusiastic, so this means we can get rid of all our filing cabinets as we'll have a paperless office, from those whose only knowledge of networking comes from newspaper articles and TV programs. This range of user expectations must be managed the cynical must be offered real proof of real tangible benefits of the network being introduced. In this respect, I'd suggest that the introduction of an electronic mail system as early as possible provides hard proof of a widely appreciated service which is clearly predicated on the introduction of a network. The overenthusiastic need to be disabused of their ideas as early and as gently as possible. In this respect, a few presentations to all the staff who will be affected by the changes will pr probably be found helpful. Obviously, the changes being proposed and ongoing network maintenance need to be performed with the least disruption possible, which points to a phased introduction of any new facilities and the provision of redundancy for critical components of the network to allow for failure and ongoing maintenance without disruption to user services. A particular case in point is the provision of telecommunications links between sites, given that such links generally have an unacceptable mean time between failure it would be unwise not to have a fallback for at least the critical links. This means the provision of excess capacity. Whilst this strategy is more expensive than simply not providing resilience, the extra cost will be more than recovered the first time a component fails and the users are not even aware of the fact. The last thing an over overworked network support team need is a stream of calls from irate users while they are busy trying to fix the fault. Probably the least understood aspect of network management is the fact that the only constant factor in a modern, especially a PC-based network, is that it will be continuously changing and evolving. A network designed to, to meet today's needs is obsolete tomorrow. You'll be continually having to upgrade network components, WAN links, lease line speeds, network software, and application programs. All of this must be done without the users being adversely affected. They should merely notice an increasingly good network service. All of this needs to be planned for from the beginning. Ask a supplier of your network server software if a server has to be brought down for software upgrades. Likewise for software upgrades for routers, gateways and X25 switches. Ask your suppliers what their plans are for support of OSI protocols and get them to commit to a timetable for such support. Without OSI comms capability in the future your networking strategy will be cut off at the knees. Make sure all components in your network are capable of remote management and push your suppliers on their support for OSI network management. In short, try to make sure that any component in your system can be replaced or upgraded during working hours without the users being aware of it and that they can be upgraded rather than replaced to support new facilities and protocols. Of course, all of this needs to be done within the constraints of a given budget and time scale. The two most important pieces of advice I can offer to help you achieve this are the following. Firstly, don't trailblaze. Secondly, buy for future expansion. The first rule will give you a fighting chance of getting things working smoothly by ensuring that you are not guinea pigs for a manufacturer's latest product. Let your competitors do that. The second rule means that you don't buy merely what will solve your problems today, but you keep an eye on its expansion capabilities. Buy this sort of equipment and next year when you're asked to provide more facilities, you won't have to go through the trauma of completely replacing what you've got now. Finally, you need to keep track of what effect your network manage management practices are having on, your, on the security of your data. Some specific things to watch are, do your dial-in facilities enforce any security procedures such as dial-back or password protection? If they don't, you've got a security hole. Use the auditing facilities of your LAN operating system or MINI to keep an eye on who is doing what in the network. Spread the rumor that you, can find that you can find who introduced the virus into the network, even if you can't. Look at the possibility of removing or disabling floppies in PCs, although this can be a political hot potato with the users. Check that your backup system can actually restore data by regularly res restoring a few random files. On a number of occasions, network managers have found, to their horror, that after the network crashed, they couldn't restore the data because their backup media was itself corrupt. Find this out before the crash.
Thank you very much, Alistair. Well, just to summarise Alistair's main points again, network management is all about managing people and managing the technology. Put organisational goals before the technology and involve the users in the network management process. In other words, spell out the benefits, for example, through presentations and so on. Make sure user goals and the technology are going in the same direction. Phase in change gradually. Plan for change by buying equipment that's inherently expandable. And keep track of what effect your network management practices are having on the security of your data. Um, Ian, if I can just sort of come to you first, as it were. Alistair mentioned the, the users getting involved in the early stages of the networking decision-making process. I mean, does that work in practice? Yes, What do you it say does. from your own experience? Yeah, it does work when management understand that the users really do need to be involved. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of the time, lip service is paid to it, or if user involvement is there, then it's the junior managers, not the real users that are being involved. Um, and obviously that just starts sowing the seeds for disaster. True involvement means going right down to the bottom level, what, you know, whatever clerical staff you have who are going to use the system, and getting them to understand the benefits of the system and making them feel comfortable um, in the use of that system. And, and, and very much overcoming a, an, an arrogant attitude that, that says that, uh, that managers know best. Um, because very often the 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 people that are are actually at the at the sharp end are the are the real users, the secretaries, mm. the clerks, and they really do know what what they want and what they need, and they should be listened to. Um, otherwise, you, you're going to introduce a system that doesn't meet their needs, spend a lot of money, and mm. end up not really increasing the efficiency of your of your your company. The act of physically making it happen is is usually a very difficult thing to sort of get going. Yeah. Um, Mike, is, is that something you would plan to put into the sort of design stage early on, a sort of formal...? It, it's very important that um, networks are designed and they don't just happen. Um, I think that users and particularly the type of networking that we see around offices now, which is tends to be PC-based and is obviously going to go more that way, um, they started because people were fed up with their MIS, MIS departments. And uh, the result of that is that They've grown in a very top-heavy, simplistic sort of way. Um, they've been implemented by typically the PC dealers, who very often um, are the sort of people who know a great deal about PCs but don't know that much about communications. That has put the management off the whole idea of having semi-electronic offices. Mm. Um, and this is causing problems now as these things have grown out of... Uh, proportion to the way they should have been planned in the first place. Uh, so it's very difficult to sort of change the standalone PC mentality that exists presumably in most firms. Well, I think one of the problems with, with networking PCs is that PCs really started out as, as belonging to you, sitting on your desk, and uh, there was a whole culture developed around that. Uh, the nice thing about PCs is, that, is, is precisely that they are yours. Um, then along come all these MIS people whose minis are now being thrown out the window, and they say, hey, but we've got to have some control over this. Mm. And there, there is a real tension there. there there's a tension between, between the, the, the MIS and, and management wanting, wanting control, and the whole PC culture saying, no, I control this. This is mine. Um, and it's, it's difficult to see how that's going to be resolved. Is it a bit unresolvable, Ian? Or? Uh, yeah, I think there's a, a serious problem. Um, the users of PC networks have not got to grips with the fact that they are running mini computer systems and they have to have all the same standards and procedures as people that have been running DEC systems, HP, IBM and ICL systems have for years. Yeah. Unless you have standards for, for backup and recovery, uh, for registering users, um, for security, um, for audit trails and things like that, then obviously your whole system will degenerate into an unholy mess. But um, until that message is got across that the PC network system is no different from a mini computer system, then obviously you know the benefits that are there are, are not going to be made. It's very, um, it's very difficult <coughs> to bring people kicking and screaming into the networking arena and actually being nice about it at the same time. Yeah, you know, I, it's I a very delicate balance you presumably yeah. have. It'll get worse with client-server architectures. 
where you're going to compound the problems because of greater distribution and complexity of computing power. There's a rather nice, uh, perhaps apocryphal story, but when uh, the IBM PC was first introduced, um, IBM themselves obviously used a few of them, and a personnel person um, in one of the head offices of IBM decided that this was a very good place to keep all the records of all the people in IBM in the UK and didn't keep any backups and <laughs> didn't keep the procedures correct and uh, as a result on one particular occasion managed to lose the complete set of personnel records. Um, I'm sure this is apocryphal but the idea, no, sounds the, true to me, but... the end of all of this was that IBM themselves wouldn't allow PCs within their own organisation for several years. It's only just now that IBM are allowing PCs in their own offices because there was no structured um, the growth of the PC, but it's all now going in backwards at this point. Yes, I mean, it, it, most people think it's a problem that only small companies perhaps have, but you know, every conceivable company has the uh, same sort of lack of discipline and generally anything else. Okay, then, well, all right, well, um, I have with me um, three experts in the studio talking about network management. The phone lines are open. Uh, the number to ring if you have any problems yourself and would like to get some expert advice is 081 681 5280. 081 681 5280. Well, my next guest is Michael Emanuel. Michael is the Application Engineering Manager at BTN, Baton Thompson Networks, and he's going to assess how useful network management systems really are with special emphasis on network design. Mike. In the end, network management is about keeping a network invisible to its users. In order to achieve this, the people who look after the network need to be in a position where they know, where they know their network very well. The better they understand it, the better the chance of the network remaining transparent. Alternatively, some of that experience can be replaced by more expert electronic systems, capable not only of reporting, but also providing advice. Networks are unreliable because they've been poorly planned, because they have been badly implemented, or because they have been poorly maintained, or they've expanded in an uncontrolled way. But good network management equipment doesn't necessarily mean expensive graphics workstations showing cat's cradles of interconnecting lines across ultra-high resolution pictures of the world. This is very pretty, but it's far from important. To keep a network running smoothly, people and equipment must perform three activities. Fault analysis and diagnosis, to quickly identify, isolate and rectify faults as they occur. Remote control of configurations, to provide the network manager with the tools with which to do this job. And performance monitoring, uh, to provide the network manager with the information on potential trouble spots and help him plan additional users and services. Now remember, that it is only when a catastrophic fault occurs that instant action is required. Panic causes comparatively minor faults to develop into major disasters. Therefore, the longer one can give oneself from moment of first failure to disaster is of paramount importance. And here, good network design is the key, not necessarily clever management systems. Take, for example, the case of several remote offices, each with its own LAN, where users have constant need of mainframes back at the head office. Using LAN bridges or routers, a network can be built to provide full interconnection. Now obviously, this system is very dependent on the trunk lines being operational. So it would be fairly common practice to add other trunk lines. By so doing, it's now possible to withstand any single failure of any one trunk line without the users losing connection. Provided the network manager is immediately notified of such failure and can have the matter resolved before other lines fails, the users will be unaffected. And one can go further. By connecting the remote site pairs of different head office bridges, not only can one line fail, but also either head office bridge can also fail without losing a single remote user. This example illustrates how simple but intelligent network design can take the crises out of equipment failure and thereby allow the network manager to use his management equipment to resolve problems carefully and in a controlled manner. 
So what tools does the network manager require? From a performance standpoint, the network manager needs to know that each part of his network is operating well within specification and that no trouble spots are developing. Are the wide area links handling the traffic adequately or are they saturated? Is the line quality satisfactory? Are the LAN adapters in the host machines and file servers able to keep up with the workloads or are they not quite man enough for the job? What is the average traffic loading? How close to disaster is that network when 300 people all log on to their workstations between 9 o'clock and 9.30 every morning, and so on. Network management systems should be able to provide all this kind of information in addition to being used for reporting alarms and watching for critical failure conditions. Management systems can be independent bolt-on goodies or an inherent part of the network. Where bridges and routers are used, they make ideal candidates for the role. Not only do they sit connected to every LAN and every WAN link on the network, but they can also open, close and restrict access to or from any part of the network as required. Alternatively, where in-depth analysis and monitoring functions are not provided, special remote monitor stations can be added. Spider Systems and Hewlett Packard, amongst others, have systems of pods and probes which may allow many remote ethernets to be monitored from a single management station located anywhere in the same network. Likewise, IBM with LAN Manager and MADGE with Ring Manager can do the same for token rings. When considering the purchase of local and remote bridges and routers, it therefore makes considerable sense to look at how comprehensively the available proprietary management systems for the particular range of equipment tackles the task of network management. At this level, all management systems tend to be proprietary. They may use standard protocols to communicate management functions, for example SNMP, but no management station from one manufacturer will understand the SNMP messages meant for another. The most that can be expected is that the management system can control all aspects of that manufacturer's range of equipment, and that it can observe and control the overall network. The real advantage of management system standards at present is at the next level up, where, for whatever reason, integration is required between several differing management stations. By being able to integrate several proprietary management stations back to a higher super management system, the network manager continues to get the advantages of single point contact with his management tools. It also overcomes the normal disadvantages associated with standards too rigidly defined that of bringing everything down to the level of worthy but uninspiring. IBM's NetView and Hewlett-Packard's OpenView are two examples of these higher order management systems. They provide a central point for alarm and event reporting and, if fully and properly implemented, a single point from which configuration and performance testing can take place. But what happens when disaster does strike? So far, we have only looked at the possibility of detecting, or hopefully, preempting problems. As discussed, good network design incorporates elements of redundancy. Its purpose is to reduce the number of users affected to as few as possible and to contain the problem for long enough to resolve it. The trouble with LANs is that a single cable can be responsible for many users, particularly in the case of Ethernet, where up to 200 users could potentially be connected to the same piece of wire. If this is to be contained, critical LAN users must be broken into smaller groups. Within the office, high-speed local bridges and managed repeaters may be the answer, connecting individual work areas to each other, to services and to remote LANs via a central backbone. Alternatively, to provide even more control down to the level of individual workstations, fully managed structured wiring schemes should be considered. These permit faulty parts of the network to be automatically or manually isolated without affecting other users. Token ring LANs have always been implemented around structured wiring schemes. With the TEMBASE T standard, this is now also possible with Ethernet. And the good news is that centrally managed token ring MAUs have now been announced by IBM, Bitex and others. And managed TEMBASE T Ethernet systems are already available from the likes of BICC, Interlan, Cabletron and Synoptics. Let's look at how one manufacturer, Microcom, manufacturer of modems and LAN bridges, is tackling the problem of providing network management for interconnected token ring networks. It is, in my opinion, a fine example because it integrates well with other management systems likely to be in place 
and does not trap the customer into becoming dependent on this one manufacturer's range of equipment. First and foremost, Microcom have provided a statistics collector, an information collator and a bridge configurator. Not overly flashy, but comprehensive in function, very easy to master and reliable. Management communication is based entirely on the SNMP standard and is controlled from an inexpensive PC equipped with a special management coprocessor board. From information collected from every bridge in the network, the PC-based management system is capable of providing every conceivable useful detail about the trunk links, even down to a dynamic readout of end-to-end -end link propagation delays. In addition, each bridge reports back information on locally attached lands, on traffic loadings, on new devices being added, on congestion errors, on beaconing devices and on many other events and faults. So, in addition to providing total control of any remote bridge, even down to permanently downline loading new software operating systems, the management station is also able to provide a very valuable picture of the entire network. Now, what to do with this information? Microcom have tackled this in three ways. First, you can read the data direct from the PC running the Microcom management station. Second, it can pass suitable LAN alerts and alarms to IBM's LAN manager program, which in turn can deliver the information to NetView. Third, the information can be delivered direct to another SNMP management station through the standard SNMP software interface known as the Management Information Block, or MIB, for example, to Hewlett-Packard's OpenView. And Microcom have gone one stage further. All management systems are only as strong as their weakest link, so when the impossible happens and everything fails at once, just when you need your management system, it's not there. Microcom has solved this by allowing dial-up access to any bridge and thereby to resume full command again. Oh, and since this might be considered a security loophole, the bridges can be set to make you verify who you are and even then only to let you have access after they have called you back. In the end, it all comes down to management systems being flexible. An experienced network manager needs less help, an inexperienced manager more. For them, the most important function is that a management station can perform all the functions and automatically warn of faults that a problem has been caused by device X, that the problem will be resolved by carrying out procedure Y, and that the spares are held in place Z. As to whether the console or consoles from which you manage the network are mouse and icon based, or whether they are text based, is a matter of personal choice and of little importance. In the end, it's whether it fully performs its purpose which counts. Manufacturers add pictures because it sells products. The customer should obtain the most suitable product, not necessarily the prettiest. Thanks, Mike. Just a few of Mike's main points again. Know your network. Pretty simple thing to say, but to keep a network running smoothly, people and equipment must perform three tasks. Fault analysis and diagnosis, remote control of the network, and performance monitoring. Aim for good network design, not necessarily clever management systems. Um, well, the old network management standards um, situation is a bit of a joke at the moment. The SNMP isn't really a standard, is it, um, Alistair? I mean, how far have we got to go before we come across something that's uh, relatively approaching a standard in some way? Um, Generic standard, that is. Whether, whether SNMP is a standard or not rather depends on how you define standards. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's certainly not uh, an international standard um, in terms of, of being ratified by by ISO. Um, we probably got about three or four years um, before we get a fully stable OSI net network management system. Um, unfortunately it's a very complex very complex task and even simple tasks take a long time in, in the ISO standardization bodies. But I think that's in, in the longer term that's what uh, people should be aiming for, ISO network management. You can't get it at the moment, so you have to do with, with the second best, which I think is SNMP. What are manufacturers doing with SNMP? Are they tailoring it the top end of it to suit their own products? I mean, how does it work? Well, well the nice thing about SNMP, which was really um, built by the manufacturers themselves for the purpose of providing some sort of interim standard, SNMP is um, a protocol which is standardised, but the information within that 
is not, mm. which means that all the network management systems that are based on SNMP can see that what's happening is depends on whether or not it has been integrated. Mm. Now, there are companies, particularly like Hewlett Packard, that are going some considerable way to have um, this system called OpenView, which basically allows you to, providing the manufacturer gets uh, works with HP, to be able to bolt their management system back up to the very pretty Apollo station uh, that uh, HP will provide to make it all join together. So it provides you with the means of doing the glue uh, and, and gives you some common interfaces, which means that the actual work of providing the management uh, in the end is down to someone sitting down and writing a few extra bits of code to make it work. Through you're essentially um, Ian a system you can buy from any manufacturer. I mind the crucial one, um, and not everybody realises that you can spend as much on trying to pull various parts of your network together as you have on the network itself. Mm -hmm. Certainly, when we put a network in. Um, Sort of nationwide X25 networks um, three or four years ago. The cost for that management was greater than the, than the investment that we were just getting in running the business. Um, and I think the other is the amount of time and effort that's taken in training and the supporting of these complex network management products. Um, certainly Mike is right, you don't need the glossy pictures, that's for the, the managers and showing people around. The people who are doing the work do require to be able to get to the tables and the details and to be able to change things fast and accurately. <clears throat> but it is a great investment in training to be able to get a team that's skilled to be able to respond to tackle these problems. Other than Alistair, do you, do you then choose which sort of management system you need? Um, is there a sort of checklist you should uh, take Ultimate, on? Ultimately, you have to you have to be uh, guided by by what is available for for your network. Um, but within within that, uh, you really need to try and go for the the most open, in the sense that it's got the 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 big the widest number of people signed up to it. The most open network management system you can. Um, things like things like HP system, for example. Um, they they are doing what ISO is taking so long to do uh, themselves, which which means they can do it a lot quicker. They're they're defining the managed objects, um, which is what which is what is is taking ISO a long time because that ISO is trying to get agreement. HP have gone off and they've said these are the managed objects, these are what we manage, mm. um, and can consequently do it a lot quicker mm. for for the end user. Um, Really, that's what they need at the moment, or that's the best they can get at the moment. Uh, so, any any system which which can access the the maximum number of the actual devices you are going to have on your network. Um, I don't think I can be any any more detailed than no, that. Okay, fair enough, <laughs> uh, Mike. I mean, a lot of the management systems around at the moment that they're, they're they're very much pinpoint faults, but really don't allow you to manage the network. Correct? Is that is, would that be an accurate? That's certainly true of anything that's been around for some time. Yes. Now, uh, management systems are just beginning to provide a lot more information. Um, it's quite interesting that uh, what Alistair was saying. Very often, the OSI is always the goal. But by the time it actually comes out, because it's all designed by committee, there are so many options and things that you still won't necessarily make everything work together. Mm. And the advantage of a major manufacturer like IBM or HP or someone saying, these are the rules, this is what you must do, is that, in fact, the customer often wins out of that, um, providing, having made the rules, they then release the rules for use by other people. Yes. Um, and for example, um, in the world of actually uh, the, the world of communication, um, the Department of Defense in America came up 20 years ago with a standard communication system called TCP, which we're now all using, mm. in the absence of OSI protocols, because it works. Because one person said, "This is what you must do." Okay. 
We'll talk about that in a moment, Mike. We'll just sort of wind up and just give you another nod to say that the phone lines are open. Uh, 081 681 5280 is the number to ring if you'd like to talk to our experts uh, here in the studio. Well, later on in today's programme, Ian Balch will focus on some common people problems you'll come across. But first, a look really at one of the real networks in operation. Andrew Winter's been to Bupa's new medical centre in North London. They've recently chucked out seven data general minis and replaced them with a spanking new Ethernet network where system profile servers run 50 compact PCs. But is it more reliable? Supervisor at the sharp end is Suzanne Freed. The new net system tends to be far more reliable than the old system that we had. The old system tended to break down on numerous occasions, which meant backlogs of work created because the secretaries couldn't carry on their typing. The secretaries all have to store their work in the same way. And what we're actually doing is the typing up of medical reports and test results on customers that have been through for screening. And that amounts to about 70 to 80 attendances of customers per day. So the secretary's role is to type up the reports, storing the work um, in the same manner. So she'll store a letter for a customer in the same manner for the GP. And very often we have to do letters for companies as well. They're all stored in the same way so that we can actually retrieve the reports if we get inquiries by telephone makes it easier for us to be able to know how to um, retrieve if they are all stored the same way. The medical records are obviously confidential. How do you maintain security here? Security is maintained by all the secretaries having their own password so that only they can get into their system. They all log on by their password each morning then they have to, if they're going to be out of the room for any length of time, then they have to log off before leaving the room. Therefore, nobody can come and have access to the work. Does that mean you spend a lot of your time policing the terminals to, to make sure that people to, have logged off? To a degree, yes. We do have links on a modem line, and this is mainly for myself to support the system remotely. If I dial into the system, I need to enter a password, and then the computer will log me off and dial back uh, only to my number, my home number. So if anyone else gets hold of the modem number, they've also got to know the password. Even if they know the password, it will phone back to my house and nowhere else. What about your team? Do they enjoy working on this new network? Feedback that I've got is that they do enjoy it because they do find it much more reliable. Um, and they can. They can do a lot more with it. If they want to create tables, for example, it's much easier for them to do it using WordPerfect 5 than the previous system that we used. So everything does tend to be much easier. It's certainly going to be a system that's flexible for the future, uh, that we can expand on. The existing equipment that we had, it was good, but the problem was uh, it, it was expensive to run, expensive to maintain, it took up a lot of room, it needed air conditioning rooms and it was room which we just didn't have when we merged two buildings together. We told the system manager what we needed of it, um, how, for example, if we had inquiries, how we needed to have access to the records quickly, or as quickly as possible. So it sounds like you've, you've been able to, to use this networking system to your advantage to make your department run more smoothly. Definitely, yes. It's a very user-friendly system. Suzanne Freed from Bupa there with a new network we, we filmed yesterday. From B I, ah, I think we've got a call now, actually, having watched that film. We, we knew how, now have a call. One of our viewers, Don Macbeth from BT in London. Don, can we have your question, please? I just wondered if one of your uh, speakers could give some comment on what they think is going to be the difference between something like SNMP and the ultimate sort of OSI standards of uh, CMIP when it eventually, eventually um, gets produced by OSI. Um, I've heard that it's going to be a much more, somebody quoted it as a richer standard. I just wonder what it's going to do that SNMP doesn't do. Well, who'd like to tackle that um, question this morning? Alice, would you like to have a crack? Uh, yeah. Um, it's, you're certainly going to have to be richer to buy a, to buy a CMIP network management system. Um, it's, it's a great deal bigger and more complex than, than SNMP 
partly because it attempts to do things that SNMP doesn't attempt to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, ISO is trying to standardize the managed objects, to actually standardize the, the things you are going to manage on your network, how they're represented, um, how they report back. Uh, whereas, as, as was said earlier, what SNMP does is gives you a way of getting data from one, point, one place in the network to another without actually saying what the data means. Um, ISO is trying to, trying to specify what this data means and, and uh, give it some absolute meet, meaning in a, in a universal sense. So any uh, CMIP station will, will know what this data is. Um, it's not a matter for, for agreement between two manufacturers. Um, it's actually standardized and, and written down in the, in the standards documents. Um, so given that, it's a great deal bigger. It's an enormous document. Um, and for, for that reason, it's going to be a lot richer because it, it actually defines everything, defines all the data. Don, does that answer your question? Would you like to take it further? No, I think that covers it. It's, um, you know, it's just something which is fairly new, and so I just wanted some comment on it, that was all. Right. Have you any other problems you'd like to raise this morning, apart from that? Not offhand, no. All right. Don, thanks very much for ringing in. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alistair. Right, well, my final guest is Ian Balsh. Ian's the Senior Manager in the Network Services Division of Hoskins. He'll today focus on the most common people problems his division's come across and the strategy he's developed to solve them. Ian. Good morning. I'm a major user of PC networks. What I need in my managerial role is a system which provides me with fast, effective access to my business tools. I know equipment fails and I can accept this. What I need in the event of problems is a speedy response from people who are interested in helping me and feel my problems important. I feel comfortable if they know what they're talking about and keep me informed of progress. Effective network management is the answer. But how do managers achieve this with the range of user and system problems they're faced with? The first thing to look at is what problems have to be addressed. These range from the users to the equipment, the original installation and the support team itself. My division manages over 20 separate local area networks for external and internal clients. During the past year we've found that of all the problems notified, about 1,600 or so, or let's say two to three per user per year, only 15% of those problems were network equipment related. A further 37% were due to network PCs and printers failing. The remaining 48%, almost half, were due to a PC application configuration problems, moves and changes, and user misunderstandings. Sophisticated network management tools would only have helped us improve our service in 15% of the calls made to us. A highly important 15%, however. I'm pretty certain that our experience is not atypical. If this is true then, where should we put our emphasis on management? It has to be on solving people problems, whether they're users or su the support team. The seeds of a successful network and its management are sown before it's implemented. If you haven't got a clear business objective for your network and haven't taken the time to develop your requirements thoroughly, then you're unlikely to realise the major benefits of the money your company is investing. A manageable network requires thorough planning up front, from understanding the business requirements to a detailed understanding of equipment positions, implementation and training schedules. Problems often occur through a lack of clear terms of reference, poor management and little understanding of how to manage a major project. All of these are understandable as major implementations occur infrequently in user organisations and details such as providing enough power sockets, recognising that BT require adequate notice for circuit installation etc. are still readily overlooked. The consequence of this poor planning is delay and compromise resulting in dampened user enthusiasm, management criticism and cost overruns. Once the network's up and running, the problems turn to the users and the support team. 
Network users, particularly administrative and novice staff, may be superficially competent in using PCs and computer systems, but are very uneasy about the use of networks. The decoupling of users from their own printers, disks or host machines provides a FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt factor, which is not easily dispelled. This is reinforced when they're faced with situations that didn't previously occur. For example, when there's a network failure, and whilst their PC is OK, they can't do any work. This can often lead to speculation and rumour about the system, resulting in loss of confidence and all problems being laid at the door of the network. At a senior level, concern is generally centred on security of information and the system's resilience. In both cases, measures can be applied to meet the perceived requirements, but these can be disproportionately expensive compared to a practical approach which recognises that procedures and safety measures can be achieved outside of electronic systems. Remember, security has to start at the secretary's out tray, and also that PCs appear to fail when the screen brightness has been turned down. Yes, it does happen. However well a system has been implemented and the users trained, if support is not all embracing, well trained and is positive in its approach to helping the customer, then over a remarkably short period of time the effectiveness of the network is greatly reduced. Common user complaints are poor response times to solving critical problems, lack of experience in solving problems and slackness in setting and adhering to standards for support. Having talked about the problems, let's look at how to overcome them. The problems are in two distinct categories, pre-handover and ongoing. To ensure the system can be managed successfully, there must be involvement and agreement at all stages of the procurement and implementation process. This starts with gaining a clear understanding from management of the business needs of the network and providing to management an equally clear understanding of what's proposed, what the benefits are, the cost, manpower, timescale and organisational implications of the system. Once approval has been given, detailed planning can take place together with user involvement and role identification. It's important to set users' expectations correctly and to win their support. This can be done by careful explanation of how the system helps their role and what training will be provided. This, together with detailed support and disaster recovery plans, forms the platform for ongoing, successful management. Ongoing support provides the environment where users will have total confidence that all problems will be answered and where changes, new services, etc. can be notified to users in a timely and coordinated fashion. This is achieved by implementing two key operational functions, the help desk and the central support team. The help desk is the interface between the users and the central support team, suppliers, trainers and management. It must act as the single point of reference for all problems, requests and queries, whether for the network attached hardware, software, training or new facilities. The help desk personnel must have firm procedures that are adhered to for logging problems or requests, monitoring progress and keeping users accurately informed. Some users work long hours and support has to reflect this. It is no use closing down support at half past five if your accounts department regularly works until six. Cover has to be provided to meet the user's needs, not the other way round. Whilst a network is based on technology, it is there to support a business need and the help desk staff have to know the business operations they're supporting. Otherwise, they won't be able to answer simple questions directly and understand and relay difficult problems accurately. Papers lately says that the government has found that the friendly official tends not to work as efficiently as the unhelpful one who gets results in spite of upsetting the public. This must not happen in a commercial environment where the help desk and support staff have to be selected not only for their technical competence but also for their ability to provide a correct, friendly, helpful attitude to users who after all are their customers. The work of the help desk will be like a light hidden under a bushel if its performance is not made known to the users. Regular statistics on response times to calls and their type must be kept and used to highlight successes and deficiencies in the service. User perception often differs from the support view of successful service. 
Review panels with selected users must be held at regular intervals to discuss performance and improvements to the service. This establishes an invaluable link providing feedback on the true perception of the service and helps establish the framework for developments of the system. Behind the user interface of the help desk, the central support team's role is no less crucial. They are the prime interface with suppliers for maintenance and product knowledge. They must have in-depth expertise in each aspect of the network system, including the network operation, hardware characteristics and problems, understanding of the business systems, the software characteristics, and equally importantly, where the cable runs are. As well as these core functions, the team must offer or coordinate all training and make sure that staff have regular updates and that new staff do get trained. Supplier relations are also key. Without good support from the supplier, the more esoteric problems will be very difficult to solve. Having a supplier liaison manager in the department makes sure that the whole chain from supplier to user is effectively covered. One simple but underused way of keeping users involved with the help desk and the support team is to have a bulletin board. This board, typically electronic but perhaps by newsletter, provides a focal point for keeping users informed on planned outages, new facilities, training course dates and reasons for past problems. The key factor with bulletin boards is to keep them up to date, informative and objective. In summary, the, ma the majority of problems associated with managing networks are people related. These problems can be overcome by some straightforward, sensible actions. Plan up front in detail, implement help desk and support team philosophies, and treat users as friends who need help to do their job. Improvements in productivity will then follow naturally. Nothing I've talked about for the past 10 minutes has been startlingly radical. All of it is simply practical good sense. Why take the time to talk about it then? Because although nearly everyone professes to agree with these philosophies, few in my experience even now put them into practice. Thank you, Ian. Well, just to develop some of Ian's main points again. Land breakdown problems. Well, 15% due to equipment failure usually, 37% due to networked PC and printer failure, a staggering 48% due to incorrect software configuration, obviously applications, and user misunderstanding. Nurture a positive attitude towards user support. Explain how the systems help them, detail the training on offer, and communicate regularly via a help desk, <coughs> excuse me, or bulletin board, etc., and carry out regular reviews. Liam, that sounds all wonderful in practice, I suppose. Most people have a, a technical support team, but no help desk. I mean, are the two usually separated off, or are they all one and the same thing under support? It depends on company to company. Mm. Um, in a lot of cases, the, the help desk is integrated with, with the technical support, uh, and the danger is that the technical support people um, have a desire to be the help desk people. It's a bit like technicians always wanting to be salesmen, mm. um, and that there are totally distinct skills. Uh, the help desk people are there to provide the security that somebody is going to own the problem. Not necessarily solve it themselves, but make sure that that problem is handled until it's completed. Um, is it very much a personnel issue then? I mean, how do you pick <coughs> the people to man a help desk? Are they technical, technically qualified personnel or, or, or general people with a good, a good image? I, I think it, it has to be your approach to work. I, I don't think that the, the technical understanding is crucial by any means. Certainly you have to, ha you have, to have the capability of understanding uh, a technical problem because if you, you have a fairly irate and experienced manager on the other end of the phone, um, asking how to spell various words like Ethernet is probably not going to go down <laughs> too well. Um, so there does have to be a measure of technical expertise, but, but only superficial. The crucial thing, um, it's almost like a doctor's waiting room or a doctor's receptionist, if, if you get one of the old dragons, you're put off immediately. If you've got somebody who's warm, friendly and helpful and offers you, offers you a cup of coffee, then you know, you're, you're ready for your frontal lobotomy without any difficulty. <laughs> well, a frontal lobotomy, uh, Mike, there's no connection, obviously. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> does this mean we're letting the support team off the hook? We're not really sort of giving them a friendly interface because that's the job of the help desk. I mean, or do we need to do something with the support team to... The, the help desk is definitely there as the interface. Um, the support team is there to give the guts behind the help desk. Um, 
and the equipment is behind them. For example, if in the case of Hoskins Group, 15% of the problems only are caused by the network, then the equipment has to uh, be proved OK. And so from a, the technical people behind the help desk, plus their equipment, have to instantly be able to say, the network's running fine, the traffic loadings are all right, nothing's congested, therefore we can discount the network as being the problem and instantly pinpoint the user, the user's machine or something wrong with the application. And therefore, no, um, you have to have um, a very comprehensive support team, a good support team, one that works well with the customer, but a help desk that perhaps can do a bit of filtering and a bit of the friendly looking after the dragons whilst they get on and solve the problem. Alistair, is, is the, the size of a support and, and help desk usually to, to do with internal auditing? It costs more to, to keep and maintain one. Is there anything one can do internally to try and pay for it by, for example, internally charging different departments to, 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 to support the upkeep of it, if you like? I, I, think, I think it depends on, on uh, the, how enlightened an attitude the, the top management has. Um, it's very easy to see things, especially things like help desks, as being unproductive, um, just people sitting around answering the telephone. Um, what are they doing? Can't we get rid of them and, and get them to do some productive work? Uh, if that is the, the attitude that's being adopted, then yes, some sort of internal, internal uh, cross-charging is, is, is probably advisable. Um, hopefully, a more enlightened attitude will be be adopted and uh, and it will be seen that these people are actually are actually increasing the efficiency of of the of the business by by resolving problems more quickly. Um, I think it, it 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 really does rather rather depend on the management style and and their and their grasp of of what is going on with this network. Um, far too many managers just have the, the the attitude. Well, you know, it's all technical. I don't understand it. So. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on just very, very briefly before we, f we end the programme on to a couple of interesting developments in technology. One is using relational databases and the other is the emergence of brooters that people are talking about. Firstly, mm. relational databases. I mean, can those be used to sort of manage a network reasonably well on top of the system? We hear, we hear some talk about them being used, but I've very rarely seen anything that's sort of, uh, you know, the sort of way that you can manipulate and manage information mm. with a relational database. Ian? I think... I, I think you can use them. Um, I think that going back to the theme of my talk, you need to look at where your problems are and what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, in terms of managing the connections, the user registrations, which channels PCs are connected to through which brooter and so on, then obviously there is an advantage in having that information accessible in, in a quick, speedy, efficient format. Um, how much benefit is gained over spending all the money on it, I'm not too sure. If you solve the user problems, then, then as you see, you, you do get rid of uh, an awful lot of the problems you're going to face. All right, well, I think we've so, run out of time to, to tackle the brutey, but it was just something that we've heard a lot about, but very yeah. few people I see using. But mm. Ian, thanks very much. Sorry to dump that in you at the last, uh, right. last particular point. Well, again, sadly, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank my guests, Alistair Sybil, Mike Emanuel and Ian Bausch, and, of course, you for watching. Next week's dossier programme is one most of you have been asking for, a review of British Telecom. Quite a tall order, I'm sure. It can be seen next Tuesday morning at 9.30 when Ken Young will be in the chair. If you haven't subscribed yet, then please call Nick Bancroft on 071-730-2222, 071-730-2222. Well, I'll be back next Thursday morning at 9.30 with analysis. I hope you join me. Until then, it's goodbye from the computer channel. Goodbye.